Thank you, Sheriff. You all may be seated. All of you may be seated. I'm able to remind you, as I do with all witnesses, you're still on the open. Mr. Wright, this is still your witness. You may proceed with it. Constitution the U.S. from enemies foreign and domestic. And the laws. And the laws of the land. And was there another part of it, even though it wasn't in the oath, that was important to you about your fellow troops? And what comes back, don't leave anyone behind. Don't leave anyone behind. And when you joined the police force, what type of an oath did you take with you? You're going to serve and protect the community. Do everything you can. And the same rules apply. You're going to not let anything happen to your guys. How important is that to you? That's very important. Why? Because we're a family. Well, of course, you know now, you didn't know then, but the result of your actions that you shot into that vehicle was that. Evidently, a fine young man was killed. It was learned later, yes. You didn't have any idea who was in that party? We had no information at all. Well, let's, let's go through this jury has seen everything, and I don't have to labor of thing because Dr. Hayden agrees you did everything really, as he said, being a good cop up until he took issue with the, the initial decision to shoot. But give this jury your impression. They've seen your body cam, but y'all were called out there, you and Gross were called out there at the same time, right? Correct. We were a uh, commercial alarm just prior to in his beat, so we were already together as it was. And the call for the party came out, so we just, he was late. I just followed right behind him from the alarm call to the party call. And what did you think you were going to go find? From, from the dispatch. Just from the dispatch, it may sound like there's some juveniles stumbling around on the sidewalks drunk. We really didn't get a specific number from what I recall coming over the radio. But did they use the term drunk? No, they used the term intoxicated, more likely. Well, do you, what, what went through your mind at that point if you thought you were going to find a bunch of intoxicated juveniles? Uh, really. In my head, I didn't think it was going to be a bunch. I just thought it might be two or three. I believe it was a weekend, so maybe they were having a little get-together. We're stumbling home. Get them somewhere safe uh, so they're you know, alcohol poisoning. They're not going to stumble out on the road, get hit by a car or anything like that. Just get them safe away somewhere. Well, in your mind, did you think these were kids from New York or they were kids from... Uh, just that brief little snake, but I just thought it was some local individuals that stood over the radio. I didn't actually read the call Did you think that they were going to be young adults uh, that you were there protecting? Sorry. The term juvenile is a <clears throat> 17 down. I mean, you are really not sure. It's very vague information that they give us on the radio. That day, what time did you come on duty that day? Came on at 6 o'clock in the evening. And your ship was a 12-hour ship? Correct, 12 hours. And uh, that, that day, had anything ever did or happened to you from a family standpoint that upset you? No, it was another regular day. Nothing specific, nothing out of the ordinary. Had you gotten intoxicated the night before and didn't feel good at No, no, I worked the previous night before. So my normal routine when I'm working is just you work your 12 hours and you go home, do what you need to do, and get ready for the next 12 hours. How much sleep? <coughs> Normally get five, six hours of sleep on average. And how far from the station did you live? 
roughly 20 minutes from 20 30 minutes to town traffic from the station of my house. So uh, if, you, over if you go on duty at 6 o'clock in the evening, what time are you required to be at, at your duty station? There's not really a set time by policy that I recall. I was always there an hour before uh, my shift started because I just want to make sure everything was ready to go, not just showing up. I needed to be ready to get to work right at 6. And by work, I mean answering the calls, not just showing up. Well, what's ready to go? I make sure the computer's on, all the computer programs I need are running. The uh, vehicle has fuel, just in case the ship beforehand didn't get fuel. My patrol bag's in there. Every tool that I need is in there. And I'm ready to leave the station and possibly not come back to the station until the end of the shift. So what are the orders that you understood at that time about carrying uh, weapons? As long as they we had been qualified on them, they've been approved, and they were stowed away properly. So a patrol rifle, if it's in a car, it would be in the trunk. SUV of a block system between the seats, shotgun, same way. There's a specific way that they are loaded for safety reasons. Make sure we follow those policies. Do you, do you carry, did you carry the, the patrol rifle home? Yes. Why would you do that? That's my assign. Let me take that back. If it is during my work week, I might leave it in my locker and just take it home on the days that I'm off for maintenance and accountability. Who is required to make sure that that weapon was clean and functioning in a proper way? Whoever it's assigned to. So that specific rifle was my responsibility. I maintain the maintenance on it, the cleaning of it, make sure it stayed proper, working properly. Well, that, that wasn't anything that was foreign to you. That's what you've been doing for years, years in the Army. Correct, many years. And you had learned that you know, the training and keeping the equipment running properly is a very important part of your responsibility as a soldier and as a police officer. Right, you've got to make sure all your tools are properly maintained for whenever you need them for a certain aspect or task. So nothing out of the ordinary happened that day when you went on shift? Not that nothing big or traumatic or Nothing sticking out in my memory right off. Well, I mean, anything make you mad before you got in that car that night? No. You, you followed Gross to a burglary of a building call that night, right? No, we met up at a alarm call. We just, we'd gone in, made entry with the owner, made sure it hadn't been burglarized. He reset the alarm. Um, or deactivated it. I'm not really sure what he did with it, but once he said everything was good, we walked back to our Tahoe's, uh, we entered some notes, and then we just, the uh, call was holding for the party, and we just, I followed him to it. Where did you park this in reference to the, the house? I mean, if, if this jury has seen these videos, uh, but they can't really tell too much from it, they can take them in the if they desire, but where do you remember you parked in reference to the house that were part of this Gross parked basically in the middle of the street, in, directly in front of where the party was at. I followed him, so I was behind him, so my vehicle basically lined up as a space in between where that house is and then the house to the west, where my vehicle would have been placed. So let's take us through it. Let me ask you, when you arrived there, what did you see? The closer we got to the house, the more and more individuals we saw on the sidewalks. And where were they going? They well, were let me stop you. Wait a minute. Did you see Gross turn his, his siren and his overhead lights on? Uh, before we hit the street, he, had, he was hitting his air horn. We call it chirping. It's not just letting his siren on and run. It's on and off, on and off, on and off. What's the purpose of that? Notify people were in the area. You know, to disperse. Well, what did you think Gross was doing? I figured he was trying to alert them that we were in the area and trying to get them to go, go back into the house. So they were get out of the street. Get out of the street, go assist the call, and I don't know what Gross was thinking, but 
in a situation like that, if the call is there are intoxicated people on the sidewalk, we're trying to get those kids to go back to where they came from so they're not in harm's way. Well, you wouldn't want to jump in their cars if they were intoxicated, would you? No. That's why I would, um, I mean, I don't know where they came from. I was assuming or hoping they were local kids or juveniles, as the call says, in that area. Did you know, notice where any cars were parked? They were all over the roadway. I mean, when I say all over the curb, they were lined up from one end of the block to the other, both sides of the road. Now, you were familiar with that area? Yes. You knew that nursing home, whatever it's called, up there? Right. Was at the top of the street? Yes. Did you see cars parked up there? We didn't come in on Shepherd. We came in on Ambassador, the opposite side of the block, so I really didn't have a view of who was over or what was in the parking lot. Okay, well who got out of it? And you're, why don't you tell us what happened there? Who got out of their vehicle first? I'm really not sure. I believe maybe I got out first, but I'm not, I'm not positive of that. Would you have classified yourself as a backup officer at that point? Yes, <laughs> since we were that that part of the city was the 63 beat. Officer Gross was the officer responsible for that beat. I was either 61 or 64, so I was responsible for a different area. I was just there to provide him help, whatever he needed. If it was a situation where he needed me to watch something, help him take a report, get, I'm there to follow his lead. He's, he sets the pace. I just do what I can to help him out. Well, you were there to back him up? Correct. Do you, you were sitting here while Dr. Hayden testified. Do you agree with his definition of what a backup officer is? From what I remember of it, yes. So, y'all got there, you got out of your vehicles. What's the first thing you noticed? The party goers were just streaming out of this house. We had a lot of them. We already seen a lot on the street. They were still coming out of that house. That's surprising. It did being somewhat familiar with the houses in that area, how big they are. I knew that was a lot of people, but that type of square footage. Well, what, did, what did you do as you approached the house? I just left my takedown lights on, which are the lights on the top of the light bar. You got your strobe lights or do that real pretty on off on off. He being gross. Gross had his his strokes going. I excuse me. I just use the takedowns, which are the lights on the corner of the bar, and they just are constant red and blue. They don't flash. It's just more of that people know, hey, there's a cop car right here. Please don't hit it. Or it's also easier for a backup officer if we have additional officers coming to find us. Do you remember following Gross into the house? I followed him up the driveway. I didn't go into the house immediately with him because I wanted to make sure that Individuals at party goers were, were going to continually disperse and keep moving down the street, make sure they weren't congregating in front of the house or in the street. Did you, at that point, see what you referred to or what you thought as a train officer were intoxicated people? No, but everyone was moving amongst their own power, not stumbling from what I could see. Any of those young adults were, were they offensive to you? Did they no. respect you? No, not at all. Well, what were you what were you gonna try to do when you got got there and got out of the car? Conduct a what I would do if I was the primary. I just look around, gather with my senses, do I see anything that supports what the call is about? If not, just make contact with the resident, tell them to shut it down or turn it down, whatever the issue may be, and then go about my way. At that point, did you know that there had been a neighbor that had called the complaint in? I didn't have that knowledge at that time, I don't believe. And, and how, how do you all dispatch there? You got an MDT of any type? Of we have a computer system to our, in between the driver's seat and passenger seat. 
and it'll list all the calls that are in progress or holding to be worked. If you click on a call, then it's going to bring up that call sheet that's going to list whatever information the dispatcher has obtained at that time. That did, information doesn't always correlate to what goes on the radio. They want the radio traffic to real short to the point. Uh, this call, I believe, was just intoxicated individuals uh, outside or on the sidewalk or road, but it didn't go into complete depth over the radio of uh, every word that was said. Well, when, you, when you drive up on any situation, do you assess it for one, what it is, and two, for what it might be? In other words, it could be a dangerous situation. Yes. Did you, was there anything about those young adults and you going in that house that gave you the feeling that this was a dangerous situation? Mm, no, not at all. But were you amazed the number of people were coming out of that place? I was very amazed by that. Did you follow Rose into the house? After a second or two, after he made entry into the house and I stayed outside to where I was close enough to hear if he started yelling, but I was outside to where I watched the party goers disperse. They weren't causing any issues, they were dispersing. No need to stay out there. Went in there to be closer to, to Officer Gross. Well, what was your what was your job while you were at the house? I just did a quick officer safety check of the uh, house, make sure no one was hiding, um, make sure there's no alcohol since it was alleged in intoxicated juveniles, make sure no alcohol that was hidden, thrown in corners, someone that was intoxicated to where they passed out and needed medical aid. I was doing a quick look around. What happened next? After I conducted a quick little look around, checked the backyard, and got next to Bruce, then we heard the gunshots. Well, you heard, what did you think you heard? Gunshots. And you've heard plenty of gunshots, haven't you? Yes. And you've heard plenty of semi-automatic weapons being fired? Yes, sir, I have. So what was your impression as to what, what type of a weapon or what was being fired? It sounded like a semi-automatic or maybe multiple semi-automatics go out in a very close proximity to where we were at. Did you have any idea how many shots had actually been fired at that point? What was your initial reaction when you heard that? Oh no, active shooter. What is, to you, officer, Oliver, what is an active shooter? It's a shooter that is either discriminately or indiscriminately discharging a weapon in a large group or high density area. Well, so let's break that down. You heard what you knew to be, in your experience, gunfire. Yes. And you knew from what you observed that there was a large group of people coming out of that house. Correct. What did that, what kind of concern did that bring to you? I was very concerned because due to our presence at that party, we pushed these party goers out into the street. We pushed them going in that direction. I felt... Um, now, what do you mean that direction? A lot of the party goers exited and went east and went west. So the ones that had been going east were moving in the direction of when we heard the gunfire. And so what did you do when you heard the gunfire? Got out of the house. What and did you observe at the point that you got out of the house? A lot of the individual, individuals that we saw moving east at a walk or at a very fast run and were screaming as they were running in the opposite direction. You know, when I looked at that tape, I didn't see that many guys. That must have been a great party for guys over there. Did you, did you observe all of those young females that were running out there? Uh, I wasn't really paying attention to that. I just, there was a large number of them. And I was more concerned about the way they were moving. Uh, what about their screaming? Is that, is that scary you too? And your officers get scared, don't they? We can get around. What, what was going on in your brain at that point? That we needed assistance and we needed to assist them. So as we exited the house, I got on the radio and said, shots fired. That way, Every officer, the radio and dispatch knew we had this critical situation. And we need help. When that occurred, you uh, over the radio said shots fired. Did you and, and uh, Gross say, "Well, let's make a plan here now. Let's, let's figure out what we've got to do." 
Did you have any communication with him? No. Uh, it's an automatic reaction. You. What was the automatic reaction? We're trained to, in an active shooter situation, identify, locate, and stop the shooter immediately. So what did you do next? I needed, not sure how many shooters we have, where they're located, what they're armed with. I needed something, I believe, that was a better tool for right, my job. I'll talk to this jury. I, I, I want you to tell them this story. We don't know. I could tell by that shot, one pistol, two pistols, what type it was actually a pistol or if it was a small salon that I can tell us those are gunshots. We're at the session. We need to find we need to stop whatever the situation is. To me, my pistol was not adequate for that for that task. I needed well, a different tool. What did, you, what did your brain tell you at that point? Where was Gross when, when you made the call shots fired? We were both going out the front door of the house. He broke to the right to start the immediate investigation. I broke off to my squad car to get the patrol rifle. And why did you think you needed the patrol rifle? I don't know how many active shooters we have. I don't know what they're armed with. I don't know what the distance is. Pistols are not made for a longer range, precise shot. Were you surprised that Gross didn't stop to get his patrol rifle? I was, but I don't know if he had it with him at the, um, that point in time either. Well, what did you think when you saw Gross headed up there with only armed with a pistol towards what you thought might be an active shooter? I didn't think it was the most tactically sound decision, but he was going straight towards the gunfire to assess what we had and to try to stop it. What did you think? I know. When I pulled my patrol rifle out, I know what condition it is in. It is, has a magazine in it. There's not a round chamber. So I know to get that tool operational, I had to chamber around into it. And Dr. Hayden said that was the correct thing to do. That was not what you were trying to do? That is what we were trying to do. What happened next? I slapped the bottom of the magazine, make sure you say that's military terms. Tell us what you did. I slapped the bottom of the magazine uh, just to make sure it was seated in there properly. That way, when I charged it, make sure it didn't rattle anything and would make the magazine fall out. So, well, the term of charge means you had to come back and the tank, right? Correct. By charging it, pulling the charging handle at the back, pull the magazine, pull it out of the magazine, push the, put it through the chamber. Well, you got to get the weapon ready to fire if you need to be fired. You don't have time to go through all of that if there's a situation for us, correct? Correct. So that's called being ready? Yes. What did you do with the weapon at that point? After you got it out, charged it, did you? Charged it, slapped the magazine, make sure it was secured into its position. I adjusted the intensity of my optic on top of the rifle. It's, we start our shift at 6. The sun is up and bright at that time. At this time, the sun had gone down, it was dark, so the light intensity in there needed to be adjusted so it wasn't so, if it's too bright, then that little red dot reticle that's inside of it is overpowering and big. If it's too dim, it can't be seen, and you don't know where exactly the rounds might go. Can't aim it properly, so I need to make sure I have the right set. Are you doing that as you're walking along or are you doing no, I'm that? walking. As soon as I pulled it out, I'm walking and doing that all this as I walk towards Gross where I hear him giving commands at. You were walking and you have Gross in sight? I didn't have him in sight. I was able to hear him at a kind of a distance. Did you have an earpiece in? I did. And what does that mean? Uh, where you saw Officer Gross sitting up here and he has lapel mic right here where you talk into and also a speaker. I have an earpiece so it runs straight into my ear. Oh, why, why would you wear an earpiece? I've got partial hearing loss from uh, an explosion in Iraq so I like having the sound goes straight into my ear and then also for my safety if I'm talking to an individual that person turns out to have warrants if the dispatcher goes hey that guy's got warrants 
then they normally take off running or they try to fight you right away. I can get that knowledge, make a plan, get a backup officer over, execute the rest without being endangered because they want to fight or run. So you're, you're charging the weapon. Uh, did that weapon have a sling on it? It did. What is the sling for? The sling is so I can put the sling over my body. If I need to let go of the rifle, it will hang onto my body so I can use my hands to provide a handcuff, do whatever I need to do without just setting the weapon down and it's outside of my control at that point. Was this on consent to the training that you had? Yes, it was. Did you have a sling on the weapon in all right? Yes, I did. Okay, what happened next? I am walking. Uh, basically the same path that Rose has taken. We've got the rifle slung, or I'm about to sling it, and then he gets on the radio, and I know Gross. I've worked Gross many years. He gets on the radio, call out a license plate. He do that. I know he do that because you want dispatch to know what car you are trying to stop, have suspicions about. There's some reason you want that license plate. Of all the cars he's passed, he hasn't called out any license plates. He calls out this one. His tone of voice is not the officer gross that I'm familiar with. His pitch goes up. Did you hear him tell that first vehicle to stop, stop where you are? I heard him yelling and giving commands. I couldn't tell exactly what he was saying, but I had a general idea. Well, did you see that vehicle stop and follow his command? Yes, I had to walk around that vehicle. And were the people in that car? Yes, they were. Did they move? They did not. Because they were told to stop and stay right where they are? Correct. Then, then what happened next? I look up to see exactly where he is at now, and he is focused on one vehicle. And he is walking at a decent pace. He's not running. He's not why he is walking at a good, decent pace towards his car, yelling at the top of his lungs, adding, I think, what we call the term in salty language. And at this point, I'm pretty typical. In high stress situations, that has a tendency to come out. Did you think at that point that, that Gross was, his perception was this was a high stress, dangerous situation? By the tone of voice he used on the radio calling out the license plate and by using the salty language that tell, told me this is a very, he's seen something, not sure what it is, but he is locked onto this car and my hearing and my eyesight is telling me he's intent on this car, there's something going on with this car, and I've got to get out there to help him with it. Well. You, would, you, would it be fair to say that you were basically following his lead? Yes, he was sudden dictating the pace on everything. I'm just there to support him on whatever it is he needs. Why did you start to run, as we saw in the video? Because his voice changed on the radio, the high pitch that told me he had something that was making his body react in a way that he was not comfortable. So I needed to get up to him really fast. And what did you hear him telling that second part of the video? Reading, reading out the license plate. Number. Then I was hearing, stop the car, stop the car, stop the effing car. Is that typical language for gross when he wants to just talk to somebody in the vehicle? Not for a casual conversation, no. For a high stress situation, something that he is. I'm not sure what he's perceiving because he's not communicated to me, but his. Being as rigid as he was, his pistol out and his voice on the radio. Did you see him take his service revolver, service weapon? In I don't remember like seeing him actually body. draw it. But I know when I started going up towards him, he was in his hand. Where was? He? At his right hand. Well, I know. What was he doing? Though? At some point, it was down by his side. At some point, it was up. Moving from side to side, um, I saw him in a couple of different positions in this right hand. Did you ever see his arm extended with the weapon? Yes. Did you see the weapon pointing at the vehicle? Yes, I did. And what was he saying to, the, to that car at that point? Again, that was the he was stopped stopped at the car. 
at a very loud volume. At that point, had you determined the general area where the shots had come from? Yes, before, after I retrieved my rifle, I was, before I take it, before I heard him and had to start running while I was still walking, I got on the radio and told the dispatch that the shots had come from the general area of the nursing home, trying to give a landmark that all the officers would do and could just focus in on. The, uh, the walk and then run up to where Gross was with it. Kids coming towards you and the gross during that whole period of time? When I started moving my way east after retrieving the patrol rifle, the amount of kids had slowed down. They were still coming, but they were more moving on the sidewalk and the front yards. Well, you've seen the video, so is this jury. Is that pretty well what was happening? Were they running and screaming coming back from the nursing home? Correct. They were running and screaming. There was a whole bunch of them right at first when we ran out the door. By the time that I retrieved the patrol rifle and started moving towards the nursing home and following Gross, there were still kids running and screaming, but the street wasn't full of them. It was went from a whole bunch to a trickle. No one was in the street. Everyone was pushed up into the front yards of the three houses between uh, the party house and the shed. When you were going up towards Gross, what, what were you trying to do? What was, what was your job at that point? I'm scanning. Uh, when I'm walking, my head's making larger scans, going back and forth, left to right, near the far, looking inside the vehicle, see if there's anything that he missed, uh, see if anyone's the shooters there hiding or waiting for some type of target. Well, did you think you and girls were basically in the middle of the street and somebody wanted to shoot you and you didn't have any protection? Walking down the middle of the street, a possible active shooter is not the most tactically sound decision. Why did you, you do it? I did it because I am following his pace. That's what he's decided to do. I'm there to protect him. I'm there to follow him. You heard a young lady that says she was standing on the corner and saw all of this. Do you remember her testimony? I vaguely do. Did anyone, as you were walking in that short period of time, and, and I think Dr. Hayden says it's nine seconds. Did anyone say to you, hey, officer, uh, the shooter's are in a yellow toe a Tahoe up here? No one f flagged me down. No one yelled at me indicating where the shooters were at, had been, or which direction they had gone at that point. Did you hear Gross say that, that he thinks somebody pointed and told him that they were in the car that he was trying to stop? I heard that testimony. Did you hear that that night? I, I, I did not. So going up in that nine seconds, did anyone tell you, hey, I, we saw it, the, the guys that were shooting the car were Tupac and a bunch of gangsters, and we all know them, and they got in the car and drove off? No, no one indicated or told us the information. Did you have any information in that nine seconds as to who had shot those shots and where they were? No, we had no, I had no information. Why? What was your thoughts when you saw Gross focusing in on that car? I thought he had located the shooter or shooters, or at least had some type of information leading towards it at this point. So, you know, we've got your body cam, but it's bouncing to the place. What were you seeing as you went up that street and when you began to run? I saw the headlights of what I found out later to be an Apollo facing gross but moving you away. Know it was a Cadillac. I thought it was Cadillac. Well, I mean, you've been in high stress situations before. It's difficult to keep everything straight. It is. It really is. And things get exaggerated under this. Yes. So, in, in that nine seconds, what were you doing as you went towards the vehicle? In that nine seconds, I had gone from a retrieve the rifle, made sure it was proper work in order, go from a walk to a run. Before the run, I was scanning, broad scans. Now I'm like, I hear Gross, I'm running, I'm not looking as broad left and right, I'm focused on Gross, his mannerisms, his actions, his voice, figure out what is he locked onto, what is he going after, why is he going after it. The only reason I'm thinking he's going after it is active shooters, he's got them located. We've got to stop the vehicle. Car 
car's moving backwards, going up an incline. Well, let me, let me stop you there. Can you tell this jury, I'm not sure, but it's really made clear, the street that you were running up, is it, is there an incline to get up on the other street? Yes, Barron to Shepherd is, Shepherd's kind of an elevated street, so when you get onto these, what we call the royalty streets, you have a little bit of a grade you have to go down. Uh, this intersection, you're looking at an elevation change of maybe two, two and a half feet between um, Barron and Shepherd. So as you locked in on watching that vehicle and listening to, uh, to Gross, uh, this jury step by step what, what you did and what you thought and then what you did. As I'm seeing the vehicle go up the grade to get onto Shepherd, which is our north south street. It was backing up. It was backing up. Headlights are facing towards Gross. It's moving away from Gross. He's walking at a pace, the car is moving slowly. I mean, Gross is not by any means sprinting to keep up with the car. It's moving backwards. It's not stopping. Gross is giving it lawful commands to stop, but keeps slowly going away from him. The vehicle is moving up backwards. It's leveled off on the Shepherd, but keeps moving at, now it's moving at an angle. Backwards. So instead of where the street runs north and south, this car is kind of facing, the headlights are facing a south-west direction. Gross is still walking up on it. Now this is all within nine seconds. Yes. This is all. This wasn't a casual walk and let me assess no, no, no. thing. Hey, Gross, let's visit about what we're going to do and make the plan as Dr. Hayden was talking about planning for things. No time to plan. Either. There's no time to plan. There's no pause button, slow down button. Have you ever been in a training scenario at some point? That's important. With all these accumulative factors, no, there's no training scenario. Well, I guess it's a matter of judgment. Well, that's what I was going to say. Correct. You're just trying to rely what you, from your training and experience from other situations and fighting together for the best situation I hate. When I said, oh shoot, I didn't mean shoot a weapon. That's an old West Texas expression, oh shoot. Right? That, there's another word you really plug in there for that. Yes. Well, so you saw him doing all of this. Where, where were you? Were you was, moving toward him? I was running, trying to catch up to him. He was basically in the middle of Barron. I was trying to not be directly behind him. I was trying to see what he was seeing, so I was, came to the right side along the curb, so I had a different vantage point from what he had. And but he was 20, 30 feet ahead of me, so I'm trying to close that ground. I've got to get. I know I've got that grade. I've got to get up so I can be on level ground with the vehicle with Officer Gross to try to see as much as I can of what was going on. As I'm approaching the grade, I haven't got up on the Shepherd yet. The car is still moving backwards. Gross is trying to put some light into the vehicle. They are near a traffic light which is shining light onto the vehicle, but the windows are tinted. And when you say a traffic light, you're talking about a red, yellow, and green light, or are you talking about an overhead light? I'm sorry, an overhead white light, not a red light, green light, um, street lamp, street light. How did that affect your, your vision? It is putting light onto the car, but causing a reflection. So I'm not actually able to see into the vehicle for great detail. The only thing I can see is what we would describe as silhouettes. I saw from shoulder up, I saw the outline of head where the shoulders are. I can't make out age, sex. I can see a height and a width for the most part. Well, silhouettes, how many silhouettes did you see? I only saw two. I saw a someone occupying the driver's seat and a silhouette occupying the passenger seat. That was it. 
as the vehicle's backing up. The silhouette and the pad and the driver's seat seem to be pretty rigid. I can see the head moving, I can see the shoulders moving in contrast to the headrest. On the other side of the car, on the passenger seat, I'm seeing the silhouette over there moving. I can see the silhouette wider, it's narrower, it's higher, it's lower. To me, that tells me they're, the silhouette is moving. It tells me it's wider, it's narrower, it's higher, it's lower. There's movement. But that's all I can see of this type of view. So I know Gross has got a situation, or we have a situation. Gross is keyed in on something. What has Gross keyed in on? Gross has a weapon out. Gross has a weapon out and has pointed at the windshield of the car. Have you, uh, what are your thoughts when you see a fellow officer pull a, pull a weapon out? If you see an officer all of a sudden just pull his weapon out, that is a key. He sees something, he's alert to something. And normally you would draw and have a lower position, a low ready position to help less with that. Low ready position. Well, kind of can show this jury what you're talking about. With low ready with the service, I mean, service weapon and with the, the uh, patrol. With your pistol or your duty weapon, low ready is more either up here along your chest or down here with both hands, barrel point in a downward motion. So if something's to happen, it goes away. Finger is just like so. We call it index. It's not on the trigger. It's normally on the guard. Is that called trigger discipline? Trigger, trigger discipline, correct. Okay. For a patrol rifle, whatever your dominant hand is, if you're right-handed, left-handed, it's going to be the same thing, except your other hand will be supporting the barrel. Same thing, down at an angle away in the same manner, finger again off the trigger. On your patrol rifle. Correct. When you were walking and then running up towards the gross, where did you have your patrol rifle? The patrol rifle was in the downward position, low ready, up against my body for better control. What happened next? I, as I'm getting up to the level part of Shepard, I'm off the off bearing of gone to elevation. The car is still at the at an angle on Shepard car. And when you say an angle, what do you tell us what you saw? You saw all of this money spent on all of this reverse whatever it was and right. scientific stuff. And what did you see? I saw the car it was not running north and south. The street runs north and south. The car had backed up, but had not fully orientated itself to run in the proper manner like it should. It was well, 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 what's the proper manner? What do you mean? If the street runs north and south, the car should have backed all the way into whichever way it wants to go. Was there any reason why that car couldn't have kept backing up? No, it was the majority into the because the majority of, of it was in the northbound lanes, even though the headlights were generally facing south. If he would have stayed in the northbound lanes, it just, there was no obstacles that I recall that it just kept backing away from us. No issues, no threat. And you heard the testimony from uh, two guys that said they were up in the parking lot of the Johnson home watching all of this. Did you ever hear them scream to you and eight guys that did the shooting drove off in a yellow problem? No. No one from any location flying to me down that saw it. Okay, so I, I want this jury to know what you saw prior to the time of the shooting. As soon as I got to level ground, the vehicle came to a stop for a slight moment and then accelerated forward. It was not facing southbound, it was facing south-southwest, it came forward towards my partner, and as it was gaining ground towards him, I had to make a decision. This car is about to hit my partner, there are threats inside the car, and when lethal force is 
being presented towards us, I had no other option but to use legal force. To okay, so that's all. That's all great legal terms and everything. Car a deadly weapon? Car is a deadly weapon. Do officers know that cars can knock police officers down, run over them, anything else, cause serious bodily injury or death to them? Yes. So you saw a deadly weapon as far as you were concerned. Yes. Moving towards your partner. Moving towards my partner. What were you? What did you see, though? I mean, we heard that the wheels were pointed this way and everything, but they did all this math and all that. What did you see? I am focused on what is moving inside the vehicle. The, the two silhouettes that I saw, the driver and the passenger. I mean, he's not, I'm not looking down at the wheels. I'm looking at what's going on inside the vehicle. I'm looking at where my partner is at. He's over here on a peripheral vision. But, I mean, I can see car, occupants of the car, and partner right here. And I see that gap. As soon as the thing went forward, it's coming at an angle at a head. Well, now, you heard Dr. Hayden say that you should have been like a rotating beacon, scanning everything, and you should have known exactly what was going on over here. Is that the reality of being involved in a situation like this? No. In the very beginning, my head was scanning left and right. I'm not going to say it was 180 degrees scanning, but I was scanning as much as I could to try to keep the growth somewhere in my field of view. But once he wasn't just giving commands to cars in general and stuff. Once it got specific, once his voice elevated, once you start taking every piece of nugget of information out and start putting all of this together, this became a really volatile situation. That car had plenty of room to just keep going backwards and we'd be gone. Do you have any idea who was in that car? No. No one flag us down to say who was in the car, what their intentions were, or anything. Dr. Hayden said it was nine seconds up to, to where the shooting actually occurred, and then the shooting decisions and all was that fast. Can you clap your hands as fast as they're talking about? No, I, I cannot. Are you surprised at, at Dr. Hayden and and all these reports as to how quickly an officer has to make that decision. They're very surprising. Were you ever, did you ever go through four science and study all of this and everything? No. We get a brief couple of hours on it in the police academy about action reaction and how to cut that down and save our lives, but we, we don't get to the science. No. Well. When do you think you made the decision to fire that weapon? When the vehicle was moving towards my partner. Did you hear something happen when the vehicle was moving towards your partner? I heard some type of pop, possible gunshot from inside the car, but that that was after the thing was coming to my partner. And he, well, it all happened that fast, but was that a factor that you put into the computer to tell your brain that you got a dangerous situation? Possibly. I had a lot of information to process real fast and I almost watched my partner get hit by a car. When you start, when you made that decision, when you made the decision to act, were you uh, trying to stop a vehicle? I was trying to stop threats towards my partner, towards anyone out there. Well, did you intentionally shoot into that vehicle? Yes. Well, let me ask you something, Roy. We're going we're to talk more about it now because they've shown all these videos. But after that, after you fired those five shots, do you agree with Dr. Hayden and all these other pros that came in here and said that this shot hit the proper panel or the concrete first. I really can't I mean it's a good there's a possibility that could but after but after your decision was to stop shooting, what do you do with the weapon at that point? After you've completed the the interval, whatever you're doing your rifle and your thumb places it on safe and you lower the uh, barrel to a lower position. 
Well, what was your immediate thoughts after you fired the gun? Make sure my partner was okay. What did you say to him? Do you remember? What did you think that, that just happened? I thought he was about to get run over or at least got clipped by the car. At the bare minimum. I think the tape says you said, Are you all right? No, I, I checked on him. I just don't remember my exact words. I want to make sure he was okay. And then you said the tape was clear. They tried to hit you. Or he tried to hit you. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Did you, did you bring that up? Did you say, Oh my God, I've, I've shot at a car and I've got to have an excuse? And let me very quickly within that split second. Put something on my mic here so that everybody will know that I had an excuse for what I did. Uh, I'm not that fast. I don't think anyone is in that situation. Was it, it whatever you said and everybody's heard, was that what you thought at that time? Being concerned for Officer Gross? Yeah, that's my brother. We've been through a lot together. And, yes, I want to make sure he was okay. Did you think Gross would have pulled that weapon out and then hollered at that car? And, Approaching that car, which you said was probably not the best tactics. Why, why, why did you say that's not the best tactics? Me personally, moving down, you taking the fact a possible active shooter, and he's going to move, he's moving down the street with no cover, nothing to get behind. You're approaching a street light. Well, that might be great, but that might not be the best tactical decision. Correct. I would stay closer to the uh, houses, move along there in the shadows, so it'd be, I'd be less of a target. I'd get behind cover if something was to happen. Well, your experience with uh, a military rifle, with magazines, and even uh, uh, service weapons, uh, what's the maximum amount of bullets, for a better word, can you carry in a service rifle? Service rifle, the max would be uh, 30 rounds. 30 rounds. Did you hear 30 rounds coming from that area? From the nursing home? When you first went out the door, did you hear 30 rounds? I wasn't counting at that point in time. I really, I couldn't tell you. Well, the reality is, is that if it was a service revival weapon, an AR-15 or a 45 with a maximum clip, in it, it could shoot a lot more bullets, couldn't it? Yes. There you and Gross were in the middle of the street under an overhead light in what you perceive would be an active shooter situation. Correct. Well, after the weapon was fired, what, what do you remember doing? I remember turning, just looking at Gross. I don't remember exactly what I said. I said, no, I wanted to check on him. And then I started walking back to that squad car. I think the sergeant showed up at that time, so I was trying to brief him on what had happened. Well, we have had heard testimony in this courtroom that one person said you were stomping your feet and acting like you were mad. Any of that true? No, I was checking on Rose and then I was not long after talking to the supervisor, I'm sure if that happened, it'd be on one, one of the three body cams. Well, I mean, when when an officer is involved in a shooting, you've never been involved in a police shooting before. No. Would you say that you were in shock yourself? Uh, yes, I was, I was in shock. I was in shock for days. You went down to where the vehicle was stopped. Was that because you were ordered down there? Correct. The sergeant ordered me to go down there to assist Officer Chandler. And at that point, we've heard Officer Chandler talk about that uh, when he was called out uh, to everyone's belief there was a felony stop down there. We keep hearing felony stop. Felony stop's more of a older term. Um, Try to use high risk stop now because you don't know what's inside the vehicle. More likely, you're stopping because the felony might have been committed or possibly committed, so you're investigating it. But it's more PC now to say that high risk stop. I think we're going to 
talk about at this point about what happened there. Did you want to stop it? Remember the jury? Uh, we've been going for about an hour. Do you want to go for about 15 more minutes? Or do you want to take a break? We can keep going. Keep going? Mm-hmm. She pretty much is controlling us. Let's keep going. We'll, we'll go until 12.30, all right? You need to stop before that. Just let me know. All right, answer. I want, I want to talk to you why there seems to be great concern here why you went down to where the, as it's been referred to the felony stop occurred. You went down there because you were ordered down there. Right. And what did they want you to do when you got down there? I was there to assist Officer Chambly. Well, what do you do when you, when you hold to go to a felony stop and process this? this what's your job? You get your butt down there. That's, you've been given an order by the sergeant. So I'm going down there to assist. And we saw in that video a car come around with all of its lights on. I mean, we were almost blind and trying to watch it on the TV. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Do you remember leaving your lights on? I do. Why did you do that? Uh, I was in shock of what had just happened. Um, I was wondering where to position my squad car because as I was driving down there, I heard Officer Chan would call out where he was at and which way he was facing. And it didn't really compute my head right because I'm like, you know, I saw the car go down Shepard and turn right on the Bishop. I should be facing westbound. He's telling me he's got a car facing eastbound. It just didn't seem to register as I was turning on to Bishop. By then, I was already facing him, and I didn't want to back out, go down a block and around, because he's very intent that he's got multiple individuals in this car, and he needs help right then. So I was facing the dilemma. What does that down. mean to a police officer? Because he turned the felony stop multiple people. That tells me it's, it's serious. I mean, he's got a reason why he does not want to approach the vehicle. Did you correlate? That vehicle to what you had just been involved in? I mean, did you know that he was talking about the vehicle that just... That I had my suspicion. I called out a black Cadillac because the thing just looked monstrously huge as it was coming in gross. But he was telling me an Impala. Yeah, I was trying to describe it a little bit too, but I wasn't sure that I was told to go down there, so... And I'd be able to actually look at it and go, okay, yes, this is the right car, no, this is not the right car. Well, did you get out of your vehicle and approach as you've been trained for assisting on felony stop? Since I came up from the wrong direction, I got out and I went down the opposite sidewalk to where I, I was a smaller silhouette. I got out of the range of my light so they weren't casting light on the beam to make myself into a silhouette. I was out of the range of uh, Officer Chambly because if he is doing a high risk takedown, his pistol's going to be out, so I didn't want to walk straight to him. I want to come out of the round uh, for officer safety purposes. Did you point at that vehicle? Did you... I did. I called out the wrong vehicle. I didn't let him know it was the right vehicle. Pointed at it and kind of moved my head and let him know, yeah, you got the right one. I well, as far as you knew, that was the right one because you were looking at it. Right. When I started making my approach, I recognized the lights. And but you thought, it, you thought you told them it was a Cadillac, but it wasn't a Cadillac. I did. I, I, I get them wrong, make them all. Well, what do you think your duty was when you were walking up there? Did any, were you on the radio with anyone at that point? No, I was leaving the radio clear. <laughs> leaving the radio channel clear, so if Chanley needed something, since he was dominating that scene, he got the radio, he had control. What did you see Chanley doing? Not really much as I made the approach, because I was blinded by his lights in return, but as I came around, I saw he had his pistol out, orientated onto the vehicle, and he was yelled out. Okay, I don't know what orientated onto the vehicle. It was pointing, he was pointing his weapon at the vehicle, giving them verbal commands to stay inside the vehicle until I got there and other officers arrived. What was this weapon in low ready or anything like that? No, it was pointed straight at the car. At the vehicle? Correct. And is that what officers are trained to do? Yes, we are. Was Chandler doing anything that you didn't approve of at that point? No. 
So what did you, what happened next? Once we had additional officers, uh, I believe it was Baldwin on our left and Gonzalez on the right, if I remember correctly. Then Chambly started doing the call out, calling individuals out one by one. Pretty salty language in that point, wasn't it? I don't remember so much from Officer Chambly or Baldwin, Gonzalez. From the body cam, I saw they got something. But did you hear that out there? No, I really don't recall. So, I mean, you heard, you heard him using pretty rough language. At that point, was anybody saying this car is full of young adults, young, young men? No, it's not until everyone is outside of the vehicle that I'm able to see who's actually occupying it at this point in time. Did you go over, were you ordered to go over to the vehicle? Yes. Who ordered you to do that? Well, once we got the last person out, I believe it was Gonzalez said some move or advance, so that's just a common term for everyone to move up to the vehicle and see if there's anyone left inside. It was definitely clear. Make sure that no one hiding in the back seat in the floorboards. Uh, so we advanced up on it to look into the open spaces. Why did you do that? For some reason, Gonzalez broke off and went to the opposite side, which is not a tactically sound decision. And left Chambly and myself on the passenger side. Um, Chambly said, go ahead, or he gave me some type of command to move up. Um, so I did a quick uh, fingers on the carotid, stirring rope. Okay, well, I think you jumped. When you went up to the vehicle, what did you observe? What we observed was one male individual in the passenger seat uh, report. Did you think at that point that was the individual that you was in the vehicle that you shot in? Yes. What did you think? It was a punch to the gut and very sick man. I mean, how does an officer feel or how does an Oliver feel when he realizes things that he's now learning after the fact? Sick man. I mean, this was a bad situation. They got turned worse by the second. People all around that could have prevented this whole. It's just a very gut wrenching experience, and knowing that you had to were forced into a position to take a life, it's. The words cannot describe that. Well, I mean, you have a son. I have a son. Pretty rough stuff, isn't it? It is. Had you ever seen the young man before that you were looking at in the vehicle? Um, no, I've never seen him before. Did you do what you were asked to do so you might try to find if there's any life in him? Make that assessment. When she always told me go ahead or whatever command it was to give me a, did a quick check of the files, which uh, learned in EMT school, two fingers on the carotid, didn't feel anything, sternum rub, I just real fast, and then back out of the car. Okay. Well, we've had this mystery and all this professional testimony about gunshot residue transfer and everything. Not any reason for you to believe that, that Jordan Edward fired any weapon at anybody. No. Yeah. And if he had any gunshot residue on his left hand, top of his hand, the only logical conclusion is it came from you trying to see if he was still alive. Correct. I don't doubt that at all. What have you assessed at that point? I informed Chambly of what I observed on my two quick checks and then backed away from the car. What was going on in your head right then? Do you realize that, that this was a, a young, young man? Uh, Did you assess him as being lifeless in that vehicle? 
And you assess that as the being the vehicle that you shot into. And you assess the fact that at that moment, that as you shot into that vehicle, this must have been the result of that. How did you feel? My heart sank. From there, it was hard to breathe. And you just, you just know, it was just awful feeling all the way around. You, you can't, there's no words for these things. Nothing to describe it, you know. As far as the parent was in the child, there's no word in the English language that can describe that. Is it? No, not at all. There's been some testimony about uh, you being mad because your weapon was taken away from you. Don't tell the jury what really did happen to the rest of the story. Chamblee either asked for the weapon or was wanting the, the weapon, and we have a thing called chain of custody. When something is used or any type of evidence, it has to be logged and documented from person to person to person to sign the evidence. I told them something along the line of not a good idea to chain of custody or something chain of custody, and it just needs to be put back in the squad car, in the back seat, locked with the whatever, and just the vehicle locked just so it's not going from me to five, six, twenty, some different people to wherever it needs to go. I mean, it just did not make good sense for it to keep getting handed off from person to person to person. And in the end, I believe it was Gonzalez who became my handler. And what does that term mean? Anytime an officer is in a critical incident uh, and might be in a state of shock or not be able to really process things at the moment is a sign of a buddy or a handler to another officer and that officer's job is to make sure the first officer is okay, needs anything, makes appropriate phone calls. Um, so since he was my handler, he took possession of the weapon and we put it in the back seat of the Tahoe at that time. And did you follow uh, the commander? I said there was a commander at the time. Uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Snow got down there a little bit after we got our occupants out and separated. Uh, after the occupants were out and separated and Gonzales became my handler, then I, I was told to sit in the Tahoe and I just sat in the driver's seat and uh, just sat there until I got further directions. Did you ever shot anyone in your two tour of Iraq and gone up and looked at the, the face of the individual you shot? No. We got in the firefights, bullets went both ways. Sometimes one way just had us, but we never got really up close and saw who was trying to kill you or who you had engaged. It just it's not like that. Did you follow their orders to go back to the station? When they finally told me to go back, Officer Dalton's Austin and I went, went to the station. Uh, it might have been 20 or 30 minutes after uh, everyone had been out of the vehicle. Uh, were you put us in uh, off duty at that point? Everybody was trying to assess uh, for their best together. The beginning of an investigation. Right, I was put in the control room to hold the start typing. Uh, I click. Okay, you don't need to go to the right. um, Judge, I have an entirely different area to go into, and this might be. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lane, for that. Members of the jury, we're going to recess for one hour. Uh, please don't do any research, don't discuss the case. I'll rise for the jury. Thank <laughs> you.